for example, my bracelet is actually in a tag team event. Mm -hmm. And everybody just assumed I played with a guy, Giuseppe Pantaleo. Who's that? Uh, this German, Who's that? Italian. <laughs> this guy. What's up guys, I'm live with Nikita Luther, the latest upcoming uh, poker star from India. She's uh, one of the most uh, well-known poker players from India. She's got a TED talk and she's, uh, she's killing it in secret, although it may not be very obvious because the results haven't shown publicly too much. <gasps> well, yeah, because of your game of gold thing, I heard that uh, there were some plays being made and some uh, against a, a certain David Williams. <laughs> bit, of, bit of a G himself, but yes. apparently he couldn't handle the nine high like a boss play <laughs> and this uh, seven five offsuit play. Um, the rebluff on the river from what I saw. Why don't you tell us a bit about your Game of Gold performance and these hands? Um, the Game of Gold was such an incredible experience. It was so unique and just being there with some of the great names of the game was a very surreal feeling for me. I mean, uh, I might have all these accomplishments in India and you know it's like a bubble out there but to really be able to put myself out there on the on a global platform and be there rubbing shoulders with the game's greats was I think an experience I'm going to remember forever and more than anything I did feel very intimidated and I'm not easily intimidated because I'm like you know, badass girl, boss girl energy, <laughs> and uh, I'm very fierce, and I'm I, I don't I'm not intimidated easily, but this was one of the times that I was super intimidated, and that's why I feel I went on to uh, just completely knit up on the show because I was making like oh in, in, insane ICM folds, and I just didn't want to be the reason why team bus for so I'm just like just fold everything let everybody else bust right. and just ladder up to second place and then my match with David came up and that's when I'm like you know what this we're gonna be out if I don't play so I just brought on the heat and I just went there to play and this is how I actually play I'm actually a maniac in real life and David had did not expect it because all he saw what the match that he saw was where I was just folding away and <laughs> so he adjusted to that but uh, yeah I got away with some crazy crazy moves. Yeah that's one funny thing that happens is when uh, people play tight for a while and uh, you know people don't really you know expect someone to be intimidated it can like kind of push someone and it can push people into bubbles of sorts and uh, in, into situations where it's hard to make moves, but uh, if you can like somehow get past all that and make the moves when people don't necessarily expect it, especially, exactly. then there's like real money to be made. It's like if you just have the courage to take those leaps and try some things, especially when you're not doing it all the time. But apparently, you've got some plays uh, back in the you know in your repertoire that <laughs> that we didn't know about. Um, but uh, it's good that they finally shined through, uh, even if you didn't. Uh, advance to the next level. Um, exactly. Why don't you tell us about the hands, about the uh, the, the nine high hand and the seven five. Okay, so um, I uh, David opens. I defend six nine off. Uh, the flop comes jack by seven, mm -hmm. and we have a gut shot. I check. He see bets, and I can split between calling and raising, but I decide to just call. Mm -hmm. I uh, didn't want to blow the pot, and I have the backdoor diamonds as well. Yeah. So I mean, not that it's relevant. It was it was a six of diamonds, but uh, so now the turn the board pairs, uh, which brings a seven. So I decide to lead over here. I, uh, I lead about thirty percent. Mm -hmm. David calls, and from what I know of David, he's very uh, you know sticky. He stations a lot. He would be there with like. King Queen even or King Ten and hands like that, uh, Ace Highs. So um, he calls and now the river brings a very beautiful card for my range. It brings the four, I think. Yeah, the four. So or no, sorry. Yeah, something like that. Like the four, four of diamonds. So there was a backdoor 
flush as well and like 6 8 made a straight mm -hmm. yeah okay. uh, and uh, so but i had 6 9 5 4 Jack seven five seven four. Exactly. Four okay. Yeah. So now I can have six eight. Mm -hmm. I can have six seven. I can have five seven. I can have uh, uh, diamonds even. I'm blocking diamonds as well. But at this point, I know that David is very sticky. Mm -hmm. And even if I bet, he's going to hero off a bunch of ace highs and king highs and jack xs and. maybe a hand like nines and uh, things like that mm -hmm. and i know i'm not going to win the pot with a bet here so i decided to just check and i know david is either either i just lose a showdown mm -hmm. or i can just find a way to win this hand with just a um, crazy river jam which is what happened david reopened the action i check he bets he actually had a jack eight which was uh, <laughs> a bigger more value than i expected and uh, he he bets about 40 or 50% pot and i just over jam 2x i rip it in with my nine <laughs> i with my beautiful blockers and I, and uh, and he just snap folds did you show What it and say nine high like a boss <laughs> you should have just said your face david he would have been so i mean mad. the stakes were too high for me to be doing all of that for me to be showing the cards uh, you are used to that uh, i uh, i usually Uh, refrain from pissing people off too much. If I think it'll piss them off, I won't do it. But if I don't think, if I think they'll think it's funny, or if they open up that that dimension of the game, then I'll do it. Like with yeah. Nick Airball, all right, all all glo glo gloves are off. If someone wants to talk <laughs> shit, all right, they got it. They can get the slow rolls and all that stuff. But go ahead. Yeah. What do you What do you think of the thought? Um, I would have bet actually. I would have just bet big because, like you said, his range is um, king ten, king highs, and all this dumb stuff. He can have flips too potentially. And I would just think like, okay, a lot of that is under a shitload of pressure if we bet big, and um, I would do that. Uh, but a check raise is uh, pretty cool too. I think um, a check raise will get really even more respect. And um, yeah. the fact that he bet jack eight actually makes a check raise pretty profitable because like he then has a lot of jacks, jacks, maybe aces, kings, etc. Bluffs. Yeah. He's going to bet fold. And he's gonna have no idea what to do with. He might even bet full to seven, although that's kind of risky to get yeah. people off trips a lot of times. I mean, my natural instincts and the way I would usually play this hand would be to big bet really big on the river. Mm -hmm. But not. I mean, with David, I just know my bets are not gonna just get through. Like I'm gonna be looked up a lot. So this was the only way in my head to win this hand. And oh sure. So that's that's. <laughs> I adjusted to the player, but like yeah, the solver would tell you to just bet really big. I think. Oh well, yeah, he bets very frequently. You want to go for the. It makes a lot of sense to go for the check raise. Yeah. And so what? What about the seven five hand where check to the river? I remember there's four, four clubs yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. There's, wow, that was an insane hand. So now I I have a two to one chip lead versus David, mm -hmm. and um, about something like that. And uh, the board runs out. There's a four to a royal flush actually. Yeah. and david decides to lead with just a king pair which was actually the best hand yeah. and i have nothing i actually picked up uh, we played for quite a while and i actually picked up a live tell on him really yeah. yes and then i was like you know i know he's bluffing i know he doesn't have anything he's he, because he doesn't think his king is good enough and that's why he's betting if he thought it's good enough he probably check call mm -hmm. and so because it was king 7 or 2 red uh like a diamond and a heart and there were four clubs on the board so he was bluffing and i was sure he's bluffing because i had this live read but i had seven highs so i don't beat any bluffs <laughs> so he bets like 250k in a pot of like 400 420 something like that and i'm like you know he has uh, uh like 950 behind mm -hmm. if i go all in and i'm wrong i'm screwed mm -hmm. But I'm so sure I have this tell that he's bluffing that I just have to kind of min, min click it back and I'm gonna get the fold. <laughs> he makes it 250, I make it 600, and then he just folds. Oh, actually, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. yeah that's funny. Um, just show him that one. Then. Well, maybe I'll show them show him that one because I'll figure out that you might think if I saw someone do that to me, uh, I would think in my head maybe they think something's a tell like that kind of thing. I would, my head would start spinning. So don't show is actually better in that yeah. situation, in my opinion. Yeah. Um.
But yeah, pretty crazy. That's a kind of sick one. Um, and then he goes all like royal flush, and I'm like almost. <laughs> like seven well, you're the royal flush read. You had the, it was sort of like royal flush in, a, in an alternate dimension. Yeah, but like when you really think about it, if I didn't have this live tell, like what am I trying to say? Like what am I trying to say with that bet? I'm just saying I have the ten of clubs basically, like. Or or maybe I'm just value raising a nine of clubs or a ten of clubs because there was ace, king, jack, and queen. Well, you can have the read that in these sorts of spots, like people can be very sticky. So um, in my experience, it played um, kind of weird spots. But uh, yeah, you can, if you have the read that he doesn't have the royal flusher himself and you have the nine of clubs, you can raise then. You can even raise like the eight if you really think he has a weak hand. And sometimes yeah. it's the case where you can just like take out the nuts from someone's range. Mm-hmm. And you can put in, okay, well, they may maybe have some shitty club, and then you can raise the like, for value or whatever it is. Like, that's that's definitely a thing that happens. I do stuff like that all the time and also make plays yeah. based off of that. Just based off, okay, I know they don't have the nuts. I know they're not looking for a raise, so I'll bluff with a raise kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And But does that mean that I then, if, then I have to do that with Tenno Clubs as well? I can't just jam ten of clubs and then min click sort of min click eight and nine. Is that if you if you think he's like weighted heavily towards bluffs, you don't need to do that. Uh huh. Um, but that that uh, that gets into like you know if people don't adjust. You don't really need to be like theoretically balanced. If you want to be theoretically balanced, you got to start doing like math and all that stuff. Yeah. For some reason, I thought you were good at math. Is that accurate? I am. Yes. <laughs> yes. I am actually very, uh, my entire poker experience has been very theoretical, the way I study, it's all oh, really? theory. I actually study more than I play, because I really? love studying poker. It's oh, like, shit, teach me it, this. Yeah. <laughs> I play it's, <laughs> it's like when I'm bored, I'm running sims and I'm like on solvers and uh, uh, watching courses and I'm watching, uh, discussing things and... I've done every course there is out there. I've done the Razor Edge course. Ben C B is actually one of my first really? mentors, tutors. Yeah. Huh. We, I went for one of his boot camps. I think the only one he actually did. Uh, huh. Like he selected twenty poker players from all over the world to yeah. come and live in this mansion in Barcelona. Ben C B did. Ben C B did that. Really? Yeah. It was so cool. It was like one of my favorite experiences of all time. Oh, really? Yeah. He invited applications from all his Razor Edge subscribers hmm. and you had to fill this form and like kind of tell, uh, kind of tell why you should be selected. And he selected people from all over the world like Argentina and Canada and Australia, oh, India. Really? Like, so he got like 20... Uh, That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. I had no idea about this. Yeah. So um, you guys must have had some amazing adventures uh, while on this trip. Like, do you have any crazy stories from the uh, you know, from the mansion? Uh, honestly, nothing crazy because Ben CB is a bit of a hard ass. Really? <laughs> like, in the sense, I, I he's my top. Like, he's my guru for me. I love him. Really? Yeah, I give him a lot of credit for how I am, how I play poker now, and everything that I've accomplished and uh, but he's very like he's uh, he's th- that's what makes him this inspiring because he's very strict like we had catering and there was no sugar at uh, any time there was only poke bowls and fresh food and quinoa and fresh juices and things like that and we were just eating really healthy waking up on this mil- sort of military schedule making it to studying like it sounds kind of brutal why do you, yeah. why do you go why didn't he take you to like no, but it was beautiful. It was like a transformation, and no, but I'm I'm making it sound way more strict than it was. But we were studying almost eight hours a day. He was coaching, and really? we would coach for two hours. We'd take a break, maybe eat, come back, coach another two three hours, and huh. it was intense. And it was a proper boot camp, like a <laughs> workshop. And I actually came out like with some of my like I made friends for a lifetime over there because we were in this together for a week and uh, everyone was united with the common motive of being hungry you know hungry and um, interested in improving themselves and uh, so living with them staying with them and being in that environment is, was a very it catapulted me and the crazy, you asked me for a crazy story. My favorite story is that I was the only female student selected. Mm-hmm. And um, at the end of the boot camp, we had a sit and go where Ben CB also played. And 
uh, 20 of us played and guess who won the boot camp? You did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and all the guys are getting shit from their friends back home when we're like, 20 dudes and a girl and the girl goes and wins the f***ing boot camp. Like, what's wrong with you all? Well, that shows, in my opinion, that just shows like uh, some kind of bias of some sort. Of course, uh, yeah. Like, that doesn't... Doesn't really mean anything, and congrats on all that. Um, did, was it not a bit odd for you to, or how did it feel to be the only woman amongst, you know, 20 poker players from all over the world, all these <laughs> dudes, all this man energy, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you're kind of not there with any girlfriends, are you, like, talking to girls, on, are your girlfriends on the phone, or any yeah. of that stuff, or how did it feel to, were there any challenges with that or did you find inspiration from it or no I at first I thought maybe it could get a bit awkward living in, in this uh, house with a bunch of guys but uh, Ben CB's girlfriend was there and oh. some of the people who were a part of the team and the people helping and things like that were also female so they might not be the students uh, uh, that were female but there were females around and uh, honestly like uh, I feel that I'm kind of used to it being the only woman doing a lot of things like you know in some in something like poker for example or my interests in general are very I don't know tomboyish uh, because like I, I love playing pool for example and I'm always playing like competitively with guys I don't know any female good pool players or yeah. hmm. I love driving fast cars I like rally <laughs> racing and things Sorry, like that no, okay. <laughs> so uh, I mean, I've been driving since I was 13 years old, and it's one of my favorite things to do. Like, I just feel, I love machines, I love cars, and so all my interests have always been like that. So by now, I'm used to it, and honestly, I've learned how to capitalize on being the only woman, because, because it's actually not a disadvantage; it's an advantage if you make it, because mm -hmm. you do get that special treatment, or you do get the extra, like, you know, things like, okay, maybe a, there are better players in India. Yep. better poker players in India but I'm the one who gets the limelight and I'm the one who gets the sponsorships and things like that why mm -hmm. because I'm a woman and I know how to play that card so it's how you perceive your how you ch turn around your weaknesses perceive weaknesses or sorry disadvantages not weaknesses and um, like yes. Ben CB's mansion I had a whole room to myself where all the other guys it's had to bad. bunk together <laughs> <laughs> you know so you have your advantages being like yeah yeah, that's one funny thing about having a weakness. It's really hard to have like a weakness and not have some kind of opportunity or some kind of upside to it, as I've realized. I've been thinking about this kind of stuff a lot. That is, so, wow. I don't know why that gave me goosebumps. I'm like, exactly. That, well, one that thing, is so true. One thing it does, I know that you know a little bit about, um, I don't know how into uh, Eastern philosophy you are, but I know you quoted Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. I've read the mm -hmm. Bhagavad Gita twice, I believe. And, wow. Wow. Um, one, uh, one thing you said uh, that, that actually does apply perfectly to poker, but also to life, if the poker is actually sort of a training ground from it, from it is uh, that you're entitled to the work, but not to the result of the work, which I had to dig a little bit to see if you actually meant what it meant in poker, like you actually do actually get benefit from it. But it does look like, yes, this is how morality, um, in fact, the payoffs of morality sort of work. You don't really see the result, but you just, but this has to condition you to be like, to be instead of instead of just use, doing something for an ends to a mean, if that makes sense. Um, but uh, the reason I mention that is because there's a subtle, um, a subtle aspect to having strength and also, or have it being strong or being weak, in that, uh, you know, that's not as like, as uh, good or bad as it might seem, and it's relevant to the concept of duality. Is any of this stuff like resonating yeah. with you? Or? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh Firstly, I love that you are so in tune with Eastern philosophy and that mm -hmm. you have this very spiritual side to you and you you're, you have this quest that you want to, that you're on and uh, that's why uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of yours, of course, and mm -hmm. honestly, you were my favorite from the show as well, but we'll come to that Thank later. Um, th that Those are very good questions because I feel that uh, I mean, as cliche as it sounds, that we are not humans. I mean, we are humans having a. Sp I'm forgetting the. Okay, sorry. Talking about Take spirituality can be tricky, yeah. but one one parallel yeah. <laughs> that I'd like to mention is that in poker, a lot of the times, you know, things like people beat up a guy like Phil Hummuth because he always says like, oh, like, 
uh, he always tries to trap people and do all these kinds of things, but it actually sometimes works in his favor if people attack too much. And suddenly this weakness of like being like a nit becomes a strength where he like gets people to uh, bet and um, just give them his money in all kinds of different ways. And in poker it kind of works like that. You have to see, you have to balance, you have to find the way of using both check, bet, call, on uh, raise in the ways that are appropriate. And to look at raise and aggression is simply to look at it as simply like that's the way that you make money is is not exactly right. You want to uh, consider all the different parts of the strategy and see how they all work together. And it's the parallel in real life is that, I mean, it's also the same, you know, you can, if you look at like what weakness really is in many spots or to not be good or to be underrated mm -hmm. or to not have something, there's an upside to all of that. Exactly. Um, where the upside would not exist had those things not exist for one thing. and. Um, yeah, like one can't exist without the other, well, sort of. Well, not just that, but also, um, well, as an example of being underrated, if you're underrated, the only way to go is up. Meaning, like, if you're underrated, people mm. do not see how good you are. It's a yeah. far better situation than being overrated, where the only way, you know, maybe nice to feel that way, but the only way to go is down. Mm -hmm. Because, where the only way to go is down. Because, um... The best case situation is you're as good as people think. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, and if you're underrated, if people, if you're not as good as people think, then if you surprise them, uh, you get a positive emotion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you don't surprise them, then you're where you started. So yeah, it's like yeah. one of those funny things where, okay, you actually want to be underrated and you want to like people to not think you're that great so that it's easier to... Yeah, the multiplier of su surprise is higher. Well, the, multiply, the payoff of the emotional experience is much better or much more fortuitous than mm -hmm. being overrated or even like rated properly at like a certain level. If that makes sense. Yes, definitely. Um, definitely. I don't know if I agree that if you're underrated, the only way to go is up. But I don't know if I agree if the opposite is true. Uh, if you're overrated or you're very good, then the only way is down. Is that something that you really believe? Well, it's um. Let's put it this way: it's much harder to go up if you're overrated than mm, it is to go down, mm. especially if there's nowhere higher to go. Sometimes there's not really any higher to go. If people think you're the best poker player, there's nowhere higher to go. Yeah. They can think you're a little bit smarter, I guess, or whatever. But but and, you, why don't you go ahead and say? And what how you think. important is it for what people think? Is it is um, it such a big part of being a poker player that? That's a good I question. Don't, yeah. Why don't you say what do you think? <laughs> No, I'm asking you because this is something, of course, I've thought about. And for, by being someone who's always been underrated, mm -hmm. by virtue of being Indian, by virtue of being a woman, mm -hmm. uh, anyone who's half decent in America is super good. Yeah. But anyone who's super good in India is like, oh, she doesn't. She's just like, you know, mm -hmm. she get, uh, she's dead money in the long run, or you know, those negative comments like that. I obviously work super, super hard on my game. Uh, like I said, I study. I study when I'm bored. Like I'm like, yeah, oh, I'm bored. Plus. I wanna, <laughs> I wanna know that. I'm <laughs> bored. What do I do today? Okay, open solver. And it's <laughs> it's it's exciting for me. It's my hobby, and I love solving poker. And uh, so it's I don't know. I, more than anything, I don't think it's super important what people think of me as long as I'm just doing, as long as I'm fulfilled in my mm -hmm. ambition, in my, what I've set out to do. Mm -hmm. But it can also be sometimes a frustrating experience when you are happy with something that you've accomplished and then you're still being, uh, you know, sort of, not being given that or whatever like for example my bracelet is actually in a tag team event mm -hmm. and everybody just assumed i played with a guy giuseppe pantaleo who's that uh this germ who's that italian <laughs> this guy <laughs> yes this german italian even i don't wait, know wait, who... he was playing with you yeah wait no you care maybe you carried him I think uh, because I played a lot. Of course, he played the final table. I was too. Oh, well. he played the final table. Oh, he's too good. <laughs> I, oh wow. Okay. I I was too nervous. I was I was very like I was still early in my career. So 
and everybody was like, oh yeah, so you were just like the plus one in that tournament, or or your bracelet is not valuable enough, or something like that. But I know how much I played, and I played pretty much through because he was playing busy playing the 5K. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, when things started getting real, is when he was super involved, and uh, so things like that. And that's a bit annoying, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a bit. Well, uh, he did play a 5K, so there's that. I mean, it must be. Super good, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know I'm, how good he is, to be honest. I, I'm, he's your friend, also, so maybe he's pretty good. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that must be very annoying. I would just say, uh, I mean, it is a bit of a, um, to to that. It's a bit of a virtue to. I would say it's a bit of a virtue to keep, keep pers persevering until people finally figure out. Yeah. They may have some skills. Uh, like, and, uh, for example. Um, I won't take names, but somebody on the show asked somebody uh, who was your favorite female player or whatever, and then and then the thing was, you know, it's not going to be you, it's probably Maria. And I'm like, you know what, I'm not trying to be anyone's favorite. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get uh, your validation. I live for myself. I put my head down. I work hard. I enjoy what I do. I feel gratification. And what your experiences and what your judgment and your interpretation of me is is none of my business mm -hmm. your pro it's your own life and you're allowed to think how you want and there's enough space for and it doesn't mean that one has to be a legend for another to not be a legend like, there's enough there's so much abundance in this universe mm -hmm. that there's enough space for every many legends to be there yeah. It doesn't have to be because jungle is a legend that Nikita can't be. There is no such rule. I mean, different kinds of legends. <laughs> different, different, uh, you know, different animals and yeah, and different. But you know what I'm saying? Stuff. Like, I'm not after validation. I don't think that's important to me. Yeah, well, it's not so important, but it's a nice bonus. Let's say yeah. um, it's uh, it's also easier to do things when you do get validation. But uh, to that. You know, to the opposite side of the coin, if you can do things without the validation, that shows more of like the inner strength, and that's more valuable because a validation is like one of these things, like uh, you know, in the Eastern um, philosophies, there's this concept of Maya. It's transient. You don't mm -hmm. always have validation. Like some days you won't have validation, and it's inevitable, in fact, that you won't have it. So it's much more valuable to cultivate that inner strength where you don't need that shit. And in fact, the Jibad and Mukti, I think they pronounced the enlightened, um, mm -hmm. they don't need validation. They don't give a about any of that stuff. They're, um, one of the characteristics of them is that they're just as happy to be amongst a bunch of different people or yeah. be alone. Um, so, uh, well, kudos for being with Stand It. Uh, you're still, you know, out there, you're playing. Um, yes. So that's good. Uh, and do you have any advice for people who might face it as well? Like other people, like maybe other women in poker or other players who are struggling and feel like, you know, they're yeah. not seeing the results, or so feel like maybe they can't do it. Do you have any suggestions for them? Having not learned a bit of this? Yes. Uh, after my episode with David Williams, uh, I was I, I got hundreds, but probably thousands of messages. I've never got that many people reach out to me from all over the world, and most of them, not most of them, but it was a huge percentage of women, and that's usually not the case because poker is so male dominated. Anyone who ever reaches out or has comments is usually a guy. Mm -hmm. But after the specific episode, it was all a lot of women, a lot of players' wives, a lot of players' girlfriends. Yeah. A lot of the YouTube comments were like, my wife loves you, my girlfriend watched you, and she's like, whoa, women can be like that. So I think my biggest thing to say to all the women out there is that women are perceived as being you know passive and being you know weaker or whatever and me playing in a certain way me going for all those crazy with, with our life on the line with our team's life on the line going with those crazy all in jams and like river races and everything just kind of empowered women to be all like uh, we can play that way as well we can mm -hmm. be aggressive and uh, I hope that that's inspiration to the women out there not to not be intimidated, mm -hmm. and also to just use your image as a woman. Like knowing how to really use being a woman on the poker table, you you don't understand what a huge advantage that is. Uh, I think I've gotten away with a lot of shit just because I'm a woman. Like I've not been looked up in certain spots and give, been given a lot of credit and. 
you need to be super aware of your table image your perceived image and know how to exploit that and just be smart i think women are way smarter than men so oh. <laughs> all right i didn't expect that but uh, the, i will say the median of uh the median of women's intelligence is uh higher than the men's median intelligence but there's plenty of smart smart guys oh too. yeah i was just saying that for no reason but um i think there might be intelligence as another thing about emotional stability Mm -hmm. So, because poker can be a very emotional game, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of male ego and male testosterone that mm -hmm. women don't bring to the table. I I rarely have ego versus someone. If they if they three bet me five times in a row, or they that's a superpower to not get upset by that. Yeah, I don't. I, I I'm not just saying it. I actually don't. I'm like, okay, maybe he just had a hand. Maybe he's found good spots, or maybe. I, I'm not taking personally, but for a guy, there you go. You already called it a superpower, and it's so second nature for to me to not be super rattled by it. And uh, for a guy, it's like the testosterone or the ego gets hurt, and you're like, I'm gonna get him next time. Like, we don't have that revenge mindset, or like we're just playing the game. We're not taking anything that's happening on the table personally. The opposite side of that is to have the hunger that you were talking about, but it seems like you have that too. That's where. You know, if you have the, this side to like the push to not be pushed around, like it's, I believe it's related to hunger anyway. At least that that was, or to ambition or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely to look at things objectively when all that shit's going down is uh, very important because that's one of the possible yeah. possible like uh, pitfalls of people. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean. Uh, and, and women tend to be more intuitive as well. I don't know what that is, but we have very good intuition. Uh, or at least I feel I have better intuition than most guys. Uh, yeah. Another thing I deeply study is body language mm -hmm. and poker live reads and tells. I read those books. There's two books. Um, Which books? Reading. I've read it really long ago. Reading Joe Poker Tell. Uh, no. Joe Navarro's Live Tales, Mike Caro. Yeah, Mike Caro. Yes, Mike yeah. Caro. And then, yeah, I think Joe Navarro. Exactly, those two. I think Mike Caro has some. I wasn't too impressed with them personally, but okay. it's, it's possible that I'm just not seeing something. I mean, I there is some stuff that uh, that the FBI guys uh, do pick. Do pay attention. I'm not. Those guys must be really good at picking apart liars and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just never really applied much of what they said. I mean, Mark Caro. Mark Caro has some good advice, especially for um, dealing with people that are uh, not really seasoned pros. It's, much, it's a bit harder to read them. They're a little bit trickier, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Can you give a couple examples of the intuition that you're talking about, especially if it's at the poker table? But it doesn't have to be. It can be in another place also. See what intuition is is not I it's not some woo woo thing that just exists in the air and you're channeling it. It's not like that. Intuition is basically learn your brain is constantly processing infinite amounts of information and storing it and subconsciously and your gut and your mind brain is related. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of information that's actually being stored in and being absorbed and through experience you have noticed that when certain things happen, then the outcome uh, is uh, skewed in a certain way. Yeah. And you don't know why that is, but it's a pattern that you've subconsciously ingrained in yourself. And you just access that, and that's intuition, if that made any sense. Yeah, yeah, that just makes sense. That's the, that's the more, um, the more like, uh, what's the example? Wait. Textbook. Yeah, I would say. Well, I would say that that's the kind of intuition that is conditioned. You gain that through experience, etc., cetera, yeah. etc. Cetera. Um, I have quite a bit of that from poker. I mean, from per, from type uh, putting players in sort of a box or like kind of guessing what sort of bluffs or whatever that yeah. they're capable of. Like I do all that all the time. Yeah. I thought you were referring to something like almost inspired intuition from somewhere else. If you know what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. So I'll tell you more like, uh, I'll give you an example of on the show for example, there is this time that they, uh, it's a heads up match between Josh and David, mm -hmm. uh, David raises with ace four of spades, Josh three bets with pocket nines mm -hmm. and while three betting Josh goes all like, you didn't see your hand did you, you just raised without looking at your hand. 
And I don't know if Josh was playing some sort of a game or if he actually thought he didn't see his hand. But he had a very strong hand for heads up. Nine was pretty much like nuts heads up. And <laughs> not nuts, but like it's a very good hand. And so he said, you uh, you didn't look at your hand before raising, did you? And then he three bets after saying that. And what David does is, he actually assumes that because he was raising a lot, he assumes that maybe Josh thinks he's re opening light, but he's four spades is a super good hand. And he just four bed rips 77 big blinds mm -hmm. with ace four of spades. And nobody else would really pick up on that, but me watching the show, I feel like intuitively, and I don't think even David knows why he did that. Mm -hmm. and, he, and later on he's like oh I was just tilted or something like that like yeah. you know uh, I don't know if you spoke to him about that um, intuitively I feel it was because he actually thought uh, that Josh didn't Josh thinks he's weak because he's raising blind on the button mm -hmm. and so Josh is taking advantage of that and re-raising him and then so his ace four of spades is basically nuts against that dynamic um, I don't know if I've explained the situation well, but I feel like that is where my intuition kicks in and when I know somebody's talking, what they're trying to say, where it's coming from, how they're behaving and what is causing them to make certain actions. Oh, sure. I, yeah. yeah, that's the spot where intuition would be applied. Sure, that happens quite a bit and yeah, um, definitely people fall and do quite some patterns. Uh, I can say from my own personal experience when they do speak especially given certain information. Yeah. So, yeah, I would totally agree, and it, it aligns with what my feeling is as well on the situation. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the show a bit. Uh, how Have you ever done anything like this? Have you ever been on a reality show? Like, was this what was this like for you to go on? I mean, you said you were intimidated. Mm -hmm. Was it, like, all exciting? Were you, <laughs> like, you, did you feel like you were going to get to the final table or... I honestly felt like I, uh, that it was, it worked out really well for me. I don't know, I, people might think, oh, I was with the weakest team and I picked the weaker team and we got eliminated and all of that, but I'm kind of happy with how everything turned out. Firstly, I got very lucky to be in Fedor's team mm -hmm. in the first round and to win that round, obviously, because I've just knit it up and folded my way through it and the, the rest of the guys just crushed it but I was lucky to be in the winning team so I got to be a captain mm -hmm. and that made me uh, display my leadership skills or you know come out as somebody who leads uh, sure. and I was able to have that experience which other people weren't you mm -hmm. know you you weren't for example you didn't have the opportunity to be a team captain oh but I was well I, I did in indeed in, in, yeah, at least I wasn't 100% there. Uh, when the they gave the person with the most heads up per, uh, experience, like ah. at least perceived as much leverage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had the opportunity to be the leader, at least from my eyes, because all of a sudden I became the most valuable asset to the team. So I was yeah. leader by, um, or at least you were wrong about how much the order really mattered and how much skill mattered. But I was leader by um, by by actual like merit rather than yeah, title. Yeah. So I got the experience there. Uh, whereas in those situations... But even I then, well. I mean, uh, everybody knows of uh, the blow up and the mistake. And I think you were more, at the end of the day, you weren't as angry at, at your viral as you were at yourself. And that is my read on the situation because um, well, you didn't... I can get angry at myself. In this case, I overreacted for sure. Definitely I was results oriented. But I can say that uh, I certainly thought that he had screwed me over. One thing I forgot to mention was I just thought that it was more EV to go first in the first round than to go in the second round, partly because I told like everyone in the second round like what to do so they can now like perform a counter strategy that's like far more profitable or like closes the line by quite a lot mm. against me. And that was something I forgot to s say to defend myself because it looks like looks like it doesn't it may not make that much sense of why I got mad but um, there's a couple of reasons why but I realized like maybe he took advantage of that mm. and uh, whatever but I mean I overreacted for sure uh, I was I get mad at myself but usually I don't use displacement anger in that kind of way when I'm mad at myself too much uh, or at least there's a <laughs> limit to it uh, but yeah 
But uh, I think even though you were mad, you handled it really well. Like you said on camera a few times, you're like, I, even I made the mistake. And and then I, I, after that, you said it's ironic. I'm reading a spiritual book and getting so mad. And I thought I thought it was it was very classy anger. <laughs> all right, well, classy yes. anger. All right, I will take it. That's something that I want to investigate more. More classy anger. And by the way, it, it, spiritual people get angry funny. Every um, yeah. that's one thing. It's but it's a little bit difficult to use. But even like there's many examples of enlightened getting getting angry. It's like it's uh, yeah. but it's anger is usually overused in a lot of places. It's like easier to mess it up than get it right. Yeah, I um, think sp being spiritual doesn't mean you suppress emotions or suppress what's coming up. It means you you feel what's coming up and then let it go. That's more spiritual than uh, you know, like no, I'm spiritual. I'm never going to be angry. It's more like, okay, I was angry. Why am I angry? Look at it, feel it, be be angry, and then let it go. And that is actual spirituality. Well, I would think using it in some kind of mature way, um, and that can often be uh, what you what you mentioned. I mean, it, or at least like directing in a way that doesn't result in lots of like extra chaos and that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. I want to talk about your experience with uh, your family in poker, especially as there's not many poker players in India, and I think there's some legislation against it, um, as yeah. some recent legislation against it. And right. uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your how your really, your family has been, um, how uh, they've been involved with poker, if they've been supportive, if like, yeah. they've been. Um, you know, if they've not been so happy with it, or... My parents have actually been very, very supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been my greatest, uh, you know, fans, and they always help me. They can see I get overwhelmed sometimes when a big series is coming, like the WSOP and all. And mm -hmm. so they will stop, put ev their, their lives on pause and stop everything and make sure that they are, they are, you know, helping me get on with like even things like changing currency or like even small things like you know oh, really? sharing in the tasks, and they are super proud. Like initially they were a bit like, "What are you doing?" Like they 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 were like, "Ah, oh, it's a hobby. It'll pass." And uh, after a point, then uh, I started seeing you know results, and I started. Uh, winning tournaments, I started getting covered in magazines and so it became from more like a question to pride because you know I would be, uh, I, I'm in the Vogue, I'm in the Cosmopolitan, Society Magazine, all the big uh, oh, really? big names, yes, and oh, sure. they've, they've all covered my story and so it was more like you know people come over and now my parents are just bragging about me and it's very cute <laughs> <laughs> and but being in India, it is a very strange, uh, it is still taboo, like anywhere else actually in the world. Mm -hmm. And especially with the government now categorizing any real money gaming, uh, cl clubbing all real money gaming into one category instead of segregating games of chance and games of skills. Mm -hmm. um, so they have recently imposed a 28% uh, GST uh, tax on every deposit so if you buy in for a thousand dollars you pay twelve eighty dollars just to play a thousand dollar game that's ridiculous that is absolutely so you so it's almost impossible to beat the system you're yeah. saying india's uh imposed 28 percent tax on buy-ins yeah intense. on uh, buy-ins not profits not losses and then on top of that you have a 30 percent uh, tax deducted at source so it's impossible to pay poker. So what the operators now are doing is they're absorbing that GST. So they're giving you, say, for every $1,000, they're giving you 280 credit points where you can play tournaments or cash games with it. It's not You can't withdraw it, but you can use it on the platform. Mm -hmm. And most platforms have an expiry that you have to use it within, say, one month where uh, like what Natural Aid India is doing, they are not imposing any restrictions and any um, any conditions on those points. So it's almost like the law never came in effect. So it doesn't affect the player. So your points never expire. You can use them to play tournaments or cash games. Most sites are like, oh, you can only use this for cash games because that's high rake. So it's actually really, really killing the poker ecosystem. And that's... Uh, 
it's it's very very heartbreaking and sad because poker in india is like at the biggest point it's ever been yeah that is frustrating but uh, does it kill it for all i understand that there are certain regions where it uh this didn't necessarily apply or there's some kind of ways around this or am i mistaken it applies everywhere there is uh, no such yeah, yeah someone maybe i have bad information just i remember even in goa where there's like the casinos on the boat and all that yeah everywhere oh. all real money gaming all gambling everything is 28% on deposits it doesn't make any sense the government is basically telling us that we don't want this anymore what like it's a bit strange because like i understand that gambling was uh part of indian culture um in the yeah. ancient times like uh that's what i read uh, from reading people gamble it's their cool. wives away <laughs> well yeah actually there's um one of the characters in the mahabharata one yeah. of the main characters i forget his name you know but he gave ram ga- huh krishna no ram no draupadi pandavas the pandavas one of the pandavas yeah, yeah. The, the the leader of the pandavas the guy who became like king yeah um he, his name begins with a t but he like gambled his like everything away to uh the, f-ing, the piece of shit guy uh <laughs> duryodhana du, du, duryodhan and, is that how he pronounces his name? Duryodhan. Duryodhan, yeah. Duryodhan and, and the other scumbag uncle. <laughs> and then somehow they like grinded back in the forest and like came back and <laughs> took back the kingdom, finally. Yeah, so gambling, playing dice, it has been in mythology. There's this Indian festival called Diwali, which is like the biggest one. Like it's as big as Christmas in the West. Mm-hmm. And, uh, people get together and they basically gamble they play cards they play this variation three card pokerish variation and it? yeah there's money in it so you're, you're playing cash some people are playing high stakes yes really? and everyone's yeah, just getting nice. together weeks in advance and just sitting drinking eating good food catching up and gambling so it really really sucks yeah and so how are you um getting around that how are, uh, do you, are you still living in India? Have you moved? Or are you playing in online sites? Yeah, there is basically some hope. So we are holding on to that hope that the legislation will be revisited in six months. Mm-hmm. And the hope is that it will be reversed maybe because they'll see the decline in the industry. And real money gaming is the hottest sector, uh, hottest, fastest growing sector in the country. So maybe it does... Uh, uh, reverse and if it doesn't reverse then we'll then we'll see we I don't know what plan B is I am anyway a live player so I'm happy to play live tournaments and just do the circuit and I love playing live because I love picking up like I said I like I'm interested in body language and I like reading people another thing sorry I might be digressing another thing is very interesting is that how I use being a woman to my advantage on the poker table is when you play when guys are playing with guys and you start talking to the other guy he'll just be sitting like that like he's not going to feel like the need to talk back to you or because if there's a big bet in front he's not going to feel obliged mm-hmm. but when you're a woman and you're like oh, what do you have and you're like being sweet <laughs> and you give them a smile and do do you want me to call or like you'll just be like sweet about it or whatever and they'll break a smile or they'll like kind of melt or like they'll 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 feel kind of obliged or like uh, you know whatever to give you some sort of a response or a reaction sure. and i instantly pick up on that like oh. i see whether the smile is reaching their eyes how they're smiling what they're saying and all of that combined just makes my decision like like that easy and that so, does yeah that does make sense there's certain kinds of um expressions that i found that are very very hard to fake or harder to pull off during um, moments of nervousness especially. Uh, sometimes I actually try to manipulate for them, uh, but I personally don't try to manipulate and kind of piss people off kind of thing. Yeah. Just because I think it creates too much bad blood and it has leakage into other games. Um, excuse me, leakage into real life. Mm. Uh, be a better way of saying it. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That, it, that If you know how to use that to your advantage, that, that yeah. uh, I could see that being really well. And it actually does lively makes the poker scene more lively which is what we need instead of robots we don't need robots all your robots yes. can go back to your f-ing hardware stores or your uh, factories and 
whatever. Speaking of which, your outfit was such a huge hit on the mm-hmm. game of goal. Your leprechaun. I love, I love your character. How you were in character from beginning to end, and even when you lost in that soul crushing moment, you didn't break character. You're like, ah, oh, you took, you ran away with my pot of gold. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it I was, was fe- epic. I think I was feeling something, but yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> I just think it's funny to like take some like devastating loss and then I don't always do it to be honest, but I uh, want to get there where something really <laughs> up happens and just makes you. Fun you, you didn't skip a beat. You were just like in it, and you took that beat and character and and I wanted to ask you about your glasses. They look so uncomfortable. Those big red glasses. Were you being able to see the your cards? You, were you being able to watch the well, board? Well, listen, I got a lot of eyeballs on me, and I got to look, <laughs> uh, you know, high fashion for, uh, you know, the poker scene. That was, that's the cost of high fashion is looking, you know, making maybe seeing a little weird. Well, people look see? at me and they they know what's up. Yeah, that's the point. Uh, so it's the cost of fashion and uh, making a statement. Basically. Yeah, of course, of course. But like, you can kind of put it down after a point when you realize you're playing for ultimate glory. Well, and not if not if you're committed to character. Yeah, you were committed. I'll give you that. You were you were in character when you busted, and I'm like, oh my god! Like, you know, there's a lot of adrenaline and cortisol and all those chemicals in your body, uh, and yeah. and there was no your amygdala didn't shut down. <laughs> you were still, you were still like, it was so. I loved it. Absolutely yeah. loved it. And Thank uh, you. I want to know what went through your head. I don't know if you've already done this, but what went through your head in the last hand? Do you remember? Oh, you I know. Think? You mean the hand where I tried to bluff her? Yeah, because you, yeah. Here's what I thought. She's gonna. She folds plenty to me. She's going to have to have the f***ing nuts to call me. I could totally have the ace of clubs or king of clubs here. And what's she going to do with her pile of crap? And that I didn't have the best hand. That's basically what was going through my head. I think it was like a decent play, to be honest, especially with how she like cringe called at the end. Um, it certainly seemed like whatever. And at the moment, she didn't catch on to my my dastardly schemes. So I realized <laughs> I caught. I figured it out. I figured out it was something something. I mean, because you, if you don't have the clubs, then the other person has, uh, you know, a good decent chance of having one club in their hand. And so you wanted to fold out. Anything that was in the nuts. Well, I think she could pull a low flush. Uh, not a, I, I didn't think she pulled a king of clubs. Yeah. It's very hard to have a king, king or ace of clubs. I mean, you can actually look in GTO Wizard, which uh, um, I also am an affiliate for GTO Wizard. Or you can look at other solvers too, and you can see the what percent of the time they have like the nut flush or whatever it is, or even a flush. Like it's not going to be a huge percent. And if she yeah. doesn't call with things beneath. Like the king of clubs or whatever, she mm-hmm. gets exploited massively. It, it probably is something like at least the ten of clubs, um, or probably like the eight of clubs or whatever it is. Ten's hard to have too, um, or like I'm winning money, and like she has a pair of nines a lot. She can have like a set, you know. She'll fold those probably. Yeah. And uh, that's roughly what I was thinking. I just think that my bluff is hard to call, and I thought that she. She, uh, you know, if I thought someone was a huge station, I wouldn't do it. But I thought that she could fold a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, it was just crazy. And actually, you guys were almost even in chips at that time. So. Oh uh, yeah. Oh uh, well, you know, I'm a little. I'm actually kind of happy that she won because it okay. kind of it breaks the uh, the the bad. St- well, I don't know if you call it a bad status quo or whatever you call it, but it breaks down this artificial boundary where maybe women in poker don't necessarily mm. feel like they can succeed or whatever. But, you know, in this case, like, whatever. She won her coin flip, so it was just, like, inevitable from my perspective that I'm going to lose at some point. And it's nice for her to lose when the spotlight's on her, or nice for her to win when the spotlight's on her and she can show, okay, then we can do it too. And the same with you. That you, uh, you know, can pull some big bluffs against uh, David Williams, yeah. uh, looking all gangster with his <laughs> swag uh, going on. And uh, uh, can it, I can huh? I ask you your most uh, special po- moments in your career in poker? Oh, I wasn't expecting the interview. The, re- <laughs> the reverse interview. <laughs> the maybe the most special one was when I won the as uh, as basically dressed as like Goku. The, the whole situation was like magic. Like the whole fact that I, as a joke, just said it was my destiny to win, like a cartoon. 
and then dressed as a cartoon character, and then the guy started talking shit, just like every stupid villain in the Dragon Ball series, and then made a blunder, and then got f***ed up, and forgot I had a power boost, uh, and that, and then I won, somehow. And then obviously he lost to a monkey. Um, I mean, it was also a little bit symbolic for me, it, it kind of messed with my head, but... Yeah, that one was all magic. I mean, magic has to be, you know, you gotta work for it. As it yeah. turns out, a good quote is like, the magic's in the work. It always seems like magic happens when you like work quite hard. I mean, it does make sense statistically. Yeah. Um, but uh, the yeah. Ha- the harder you work, the luckier you get. Well, that appears true. Um, that appears true logically because, you know, the more instances of chances, the more chances you are you have to get lucky for parabolic upside happen with more perseverance, and you have to aim for those asymmetric upsides. Does this make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, so two books I'll throw out is one, um, there's this book uh, about how to get lucky. Um, I forget oh, by who it's called, but it's uh, The Luck title. Pact or something like that. I need to get the exact book. I think I'll put it, I'll find it and put it in the, um, in the, in the uh, what is it? I think it's by, the last name, the author's last name is Wiseman. Um, okay. But I'll put it in the description. And the other one is um, Anti-Fragile by Nicholas, uh, no wait, Nassim Taleb, uh, where he talks about asymmetric, aiming for asymmetric uh, asymmetric risks. Um, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, making risks so that there's asymmetric upside is what mm. what is, uh, it's a very good book, it's very interesting. Um, yeah. I know that risk taking is a big, about, big thing about how you take your life and how you yeah. live your life, and you even made a, pod, a, a TED talk. A TED talk it. called "If you risk nothing, then you risk everything." Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, it, that's that's about the the asymmetric risk of. I don't know if it is asymmetric or not, but um, it's about the risk of not doing anything and actually losing slowly would be mm-hmm. the uh, parallel of that. Is what is how I interpret it. Would you say that? Why don't you explain your TED talk for us in a nutshell? Um, I spoke about a few things. Yes, risk was one of them. I do believe that if you keep coloring between the lines, you're not going to be, you're not, you're not going to do anything extraordinary with your life. Like, mm-hmm. uh, you have to push the envelope. You have to, growth begins outside your comfort zone. And the more uncomfortable you are every day mm-hmm. is how much you can expect to grow. Sure. And if every day you wake up and you're comfortable, you are, you're not growing and which is fine you don't always have to be hard on yourself but i'm extremely i'm uncomfortable if i'm not uncomfortable like you know because i'm like no. oh f- what am i doing wrong with my life there's uh, you know there's i'm Same. i'm enjoying my life right now <laughs> why you get out there and get your ass kicked a little bit yeah exactly so i i want to keep pushing myself uh this time is never going to come back my uh, you know out of my 20s and my 30s and I'm not going to be young for too long. This is what I do with my life now is going to always last. And um, so it's very important to keep uh, operating outside of your comfort zone, firstly. Secondly, uh, one of the things that's basically taking risks or or a a subset of that. And secondly, I spoke about detachment from outcomes, which mm-hmm. you had also touched upon briefly earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Krishna quote was, yeah. was from that. Yeah, if, uh, so what you, you can't control how things play out in your life at most times, but you can always increase the odds of success. And actually, on the contrary, the more detached you are from the outcome is, how often you can actually expect to succeed because if you're too attached to that outcome you're thinking of, of the wrong things you're not thinking of the, the due diligence you're not thinking of the journey and you're not taking the the downsides and the negativity in a constructive way where you can grow from it because of course you can only grow from failure failure is not something that you experience one time and then that life is over that's it you just go quietly uh, to your grave it's not like that failure is an ongoing process it teaches you things you grow you learn from it and i i don't know if i've just gone off on a few tangents it's it's, it's cool did you know by the way that the they constantly push your comfort zone but not so much that it's that it's overbearing is actually the principle of yoga or it's the, the foundation. Sorry, say that again. The, to push a comfort zone, 
but not to push it too hard, push it steadily is actually mm -hmm. the idea behind yoga. In fact, that's what you're supposed to do within yoga, not just as like a physical practice, but as like a life philosophy. It's literally, from my understanding, I, would, I could be wrong about this, but my understanding is literally like something like theory and practice. Like the more I personally went into and studied some of this, uh, especially the Eastern philosophies, but even actually the uh, old Christian ones and the old things in various religions, they all are actually quite logical. Mm -hmm. It's quite a surprise, um, but things get convoluted and whatever. There's a lot of things like that in there. And as you suggest, I also came to the same conclusion that the path suggested through these religions was actually the optimal life path. It became to look more and more like this. Um, um, like that's what it's... Uh, it's better, yeah, to not care too much. I mean, the principle of equanimity and all yeah. that. Uh, and by you taking a TED Talk, you're actually living your principle of <laughs> breaking your comfort zone because it's not easy to have a TED Talk and speak yeah. in front of everyone and all yeah. that stuff. So I thought that was cool. Thank and, you. Um, are there any crazy uh, life things that you've done that embody your principle that are also stories that aren't necessarily poker, but they can be poker? Um, I feel that's a, that's a very tough question. I will have to think about that. Maybe uh, uh, spontaneous trips. Uh, let's see, like you took you took to learning a new skill. Like yeah. The race car driving you mentioned. Did you ever drive some like go yeah. on a, go? Did you ever get in a street race or uh, <laughs> race someone on a racetrack or whatever it was? Yeah, I mean not, nothing outlandish. Like one of the ways I live my principle is that. I grab every opportunity. Like most poker players, they get caught up in evaluating EV and they're like, okay, how much am I going to benefit mm -hmm. if I do this and this is the exact payoff or whatever. I'm not always thinking, okay, what is the immediate tangible reward from everything that I do or everything that comes. I grab every opportunity with, it, with, my, with my hands and teeth mm -hmm. and I'm like, I'm going to try and do everything. Yeah, after a certain point, you do graduate to trying to still be discerning in what you choose to do, but but you you should be able to be willing to put yourself out there in situations that don't give an immediate tangible result. But when you look back, you think that this was actually the very, the very valuable thing in my life, and mm -hmm. everything doesn't have to be money, money, money. Like you put yourself, oh, sure. yeah, if you put yourself out there, have experiences. Um, I'm not referring to anything specific here, but it ranges from everything. Like I can give some examples from my life. Yes, please. Um, okay, so <laughs> this, by the way, was the reason why I did it, did participate in the the strip poker video. Uh, for <laughs> one thing, that actually was basically my thought process. Um, but um, one thing to say is the overarching principle, and it actually shows in entrepreneurship as well, which is that um, once you have roughly about sixty percent of the information, it's actually more, more beneficial to make a decision rather than like wait to get the full picture because you can yeah. totally get there's endless endless possibilities of like deliberating over different facts yeah. and or different details because you never get like the 100% answer especially yeah. in life where it's always incomplete information and another thing is if you do make the decision you can now pivot later on and realize okay it's the wrong decision and go back and like turn around is yeah. is what you're supposed to do in any entrepreneurial mm -hmm. adventure um, or Make which iterations based on your 60% product and then mm -hmm. iterate to the optimum product based on the reaction from the market because the market is always right. And yeah, well, you can't totally. argue with the market. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it also applies to real life as well. I mean, like, it's not just, you know, something... What I say is, what we're saying is not just in the context of making money, but it's also in the context of, okay, how do you live your best life? Like, why optimize for how much money you're trying to make all the time. That's one thing that hit me. It's like, why the f why should I optimize for how much money that I'm trying to make? That seems ridiculous if I'm going to use that money to do something good anyway. Use something to do something that fulfills me. Um, another an example in my real life was actually this podcast. Uh, this because this podcast was like it wasn't something like I'm not making any money from this, but the whole principle of this podcast was to grow in like an assortment of ways, such as to be able to get the best out of who I'm interviewing, um, to be able to run like a small company, as it turns out. Uh, I have to learn this to become more organized and things like that. And there's a lot of different positives that came out of it that are not money. And exactly. uh, 
maybe it can work. We're getting some views, and uh, yeah, it's exciting. Why don't you tell us uh, what kind of plans you have for the future? Are going to focus purely on poker? Are you going to do other things? Is there another TED Talk in store? Are there any covers of magazines that are coming out? Are you going to go on another reality show? <laughs> I am open to all of the above. I I have some plans, but I'm one of those people who only speak about things after they are done. Yeah. I don't just say things, and then when, if they don't work out or they don't pan out, then... Um, I, a, I don't want to look stupid, and B, there is also a scientific and uh, psychological reason why you shouldn't talk about things before they are done, because it gives you the dopamine release or the serotonin release of already having done it, a percentage of it, and then your motivation to do the actual thing actually goes down. So, because you're not just talking about it once, you're talking about it like it's already done, and then when it mm -hmm. actually comes down to it, your all your energy is not focused there. Yeah. And that's, that's a scientific sort of thing, but... You, uh, you, we, we'll be in touch now, and you'll see. We'll, uh, I hope to do some cool things. I do hope. Uh, you could give an example of one uh, that's highly likely. <laughs> an example. Um, I, I want to be, uh, you know, I want to be the face of female pokers for everyone around the world. Okay, now that's, that's a, big a very one. big that's a very big statement to make, but okay. by face I mean I want to set a certain standard of how women play and not that all women are tight or women are incompetent or women don't have that hunger or I want to break all those stereotypes. Well, you are um, breaking forward. many of them already. You've already yes. shown yourself as an example. Thank you for saying that and I want to double down on that moving forward and I hope uh, you can only do that by really doing uh, not just saying things by actually showing it in I agree yeah uh, practice and that is definitely a quest that and I'm in inspired and motivated to be so in. maybe you should be thankful that you didn't get the validation of having achieved it yet because that's another version of dopamine release exactly as of saying it so yeah. that now you can remain hungry I thought about I had similar things and thought well maybe it's actually good that you know I don't have exactly what I want uh, it's kind of messed with my head a little bit yeah. but uh, yeah maybe it's a good thing in fact but I believe that you can do it and uh, <laughs> you, you have uh, the support nice of the jungle and uh, I mean from what I can see you've demonstrated all those qualities <laughs> Thank you, Jungle. It means a lot, and uh, that's a, a very interesting thing that you touched upon. That what actually keeps the fire burning and keeps you hungry and everything is uh, the feeling of not not being there yet. Mm -hmm. And so you keep pushing it, you keep pushing it. But then you look at you know the top athletes in the world or the top accomplished uh, accomplished. So you know they all have that trait. They have that trait. Even Alex Ramosi. And I believe uh, in Chris Williamson's podcast, they even say like all the super successful people feel that they're they haven't quite reached uh, where they're supposed mm, to be. That's okay. like a common trait of all of them. Uh, so like you're know. talking to Michael Phelps and Tiger Woods and Ronaldo and the legends in each field. Like, well, I don't know of those ones specifically, but uh, I think it was true about Alex Ramosi especially. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. He talks about this quite a lot. Uh, I like a lot of his stuff. And, uh, yeah, I don't remember precisely the podcast, but uh, it's just an over... It makes a lot of sense because if you have that feeling inside, you make it reality, right? Yeah. Like, what you feel on the inside becomes reality eventually. It's just like, if you keep pressing on it. Makes sense. I know we, we should... Uh, we're wrapping up now, but I wanted to ask you a question. You also. can ask me yeah. a question, sure. Okay. Uh, how do you ever feel you the imposter syndrome? Is that something that you've experienced? Yes, and how do you deal time. with that? You know, you know. Here's <laughs> how I deal with it. Uh, I, you know, at some point my mind can kind of screw myself in all kinds of ways. But one thing I realize is, well, probably everyone deals with it first of all, and it's yet another like, you know, this guy Paramhansa Yogananda says something like, I don't, I couldn't re find the quote, but it was good. But he said that basically. Everything is like basically a permutation of light. Um, and the way that I interpreted that, or the way that I thought of this idea before reading that, that which I agreed with, is that, um, you know, this doubt that you're talking about, you just have to like keep being that person until 
you know, that doubt goes away. This doubt is still another barrier in this mm. case towards that mm. reality. Like, obviously, the more that you fall into that trap, it's kind of this weird thing where even if you're not, like, 100% that person, um, the more that you fall in the trap of the believing that you're not that person, the more mm. true that is, mm -hmm. whereas the opposite is not true. If you believe, okay, no, I can, maybe I'm not perfect, but I can, you know, I still act in ways to become that person. And then that, that would be a way to supersede that kind of doubt. It's like, okay, well, logically, what I need to do is just be that person as much as possible. And I am the person. And yeah. that was probably a big realization for me, actually, is one day I realized the character doesn't define me. It's my actions define my character. Like, if I do bold things, wow, I'm yeah. a bold person. If I'm confident, if I do confident things, and I wasn't so confident at the time, I'm a confident person. Like, that's just how it works. Yeah. Right? And uh, I think that's a really important realization for people to, to have. It was actually a crazy day. I went from like wildly despondent to wildly happy, and <laughs> it was a very funny day. That's amazing. Uh, it's I think a question very pertinent to poker players, especially because um, poker involves, of course, an element of luck. Mm -hmm. And if you win a certain amount of times, you don't always believe in yourself. You're like, okay, I got lucky to be there. And sure. uh, so imposter well, syndrome is something. Huh? Imposter syndrome is something very common. I feel in in general with people and in, but on the contrary, poker players also have a lot of entitlement. Like, oh, I'm better than this guy. I don't win. Like, well, <laughs> there's a po positive and a negative side to entitlement too. The negative side is when you feel like you you try to. Um, I mean, you can see it. It's not it's not 100 percent bad, but when someone you know, they lose and they, they say something that they're not supposed to, that creates a negative reaction, like they get really angry, like myself, for example, it, uh, it can show that they're very, um, that they really feel like they should have won, as you said, and that's, it's not the feeling of really wanting to win that's bad. Uh, this is actually a good example of, like, using anger in a more positive way or whatever it is. It's the, the explosion of anger in a way as to sort of control the situation versus um, using it within to mm -hmm. hold that anger within and say, okay, I'm going to like keep grinding until I get there kind of situation. Mm -hmm. That's what would be, would have been what I think considered to be the mature result is to exactly, like yeah. use that energy instead of like release it outwards. It's the same principle as you talked about, I think, where, you know, if you say it, it, you actually uh, kind of, you get some kind of feeling back Yeah. or you actually, you can kind of, kind of get like kicked back. From, from people saying some shit back also, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's my way of understanding that. It's not it's not the feeling that's bad. It's the the manifestation that can be bad. Wow, very well said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you agree. I think this makes <laughs> sense. That's my psychoanalysis. Yes. <laughs> and um, any last words before we wrap things up? Um, I think uh, we covered a lot, very diverse range of topics. Uh, it was really nice talking to you and I'm glad so. we finally did this in the beautiful Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, uh, I think my message is going to all be biased towards women. Uh, you guys can play and um, I'm excited, I'm excited to see where this takes us. The game of goal is really broken some barriers in terms of the perception of poker being non-mainstream not for people you know who don't really fully understand poker are also engrossed in it they've done a really good job with the show um it'll be i i hope poker this makes poker bigger and more uh, easier to adopt mm -hmm. in general and uh, yeah you're such an inspiration i'm so so happy to be and so grateful to be on the show Thank you, yes. and uh, I hope to see you accomplish more and more. Yes, I'm only just getting started. All right, great. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. All right, bye guys. Bye. Thank you for your time. Thank you.